All right, let's get started. Welcome back. Um, today, more on explaining crime. Two weeks ago, we started with um, explanations. Um, we touched on uh, so-called paradigms, certain abstract ways of thinking about crime, crime control. We talked about various explanatory levels, if you can remember, the macro, the meso, the micro. Um, and we tried applying that to a particular event, um, watching that documentary called Kalban. We uh, tried to understand the um, push and pull factors that actually uh, led to that horrible event. What made Dylan and Eric uh, do such a thing? Um, today, I want to deal more explicitly with distinct criminological theories. Um, obviously, there's a lot of chapters uh, to read for this week. Uh, theory is important. I am aware of the fact that this is an applied science. So uh, we want to do something about crime as well, intervening if possible. But in order to do that, we need to know what is going on. If we don't know what the nature of the problem is, then it's very hard to uh, address certain issues. Um, so today I want to uh, offer you the most important theories out there. Um, sometimes they go under different names that might be confusing if you're trying to study criminology. Um, but I will make sure to uh, really distinguish one another. Um, the most important one, um, from a macro point of view, one could argue, we have been talking about this before, um, starting with Lombroso, if you can remember, that Italian doctor who measured skulls. Um, of course, we no longer do that. That's no longer considered um, science in this day and age. Uh, that is, you know, that correlation between the size of your skull and crime, that's rather problematic. Nonetheless, obviously there are still people who are into biology and use biology um, you know, as a science to understand the genesis of crime or uh, why certain people are more prone to criminal behavior than others. Uh, so there is still biological theory, there are biocriminologists out there. Uh, and they use um, they use, you know, typically in this day and age, they focus on the genetic makeup, um, certain personality disorders, and the still the basic assumption is that people who commit crime are different from us law-abiding citizens. Um, as individuals, there's something that sets them apart. So they are recognizable. No longer we have this naive assumption that this is very easily uh, detected uh, looking at someone's physical features. But the idea is there are certain processes in the brain. Typically what we see is you see a trend from the external, the physical appearance, to more subtle processes in the brain. Um, but what it still has in common is the assumption that it is uh, nature, which is very important. You know, the way someone was born. Um, and nowadays, obviously, uh, also biocriminologists argue, well, there's obviously an interplay between nature and nurture, right? There's no one out there who will claim it's all about nature, no matter how you're being brought up, um, the way you uh, were born will define your life. So, you know, even biocriminologists argue, well, it is multi-causal, uh, obviously social factors are also important. But the emphasis is mostly on the genetics, on nature, basically. Um, and this is obviously also a very problematic terrain. Uh, if you read about this, biocriminology, it has a very negative connotation. Why you think that is? Why is the reputation so problematic? Right, right. And what could be the consequence if you 
not only set individuals apart, but even groups, <coughs> how do you mean these are inferior? Absolutely. That's brilliant. That's a very good point. And you still have, obviously, I mean, if you are a credible scientist, uh, you might write in a very nuanced way, but there are certain people who typically exploit this research, right, to, um, you know, for their own political agenda. And then they might, for example, there's a very well-known study, the bell curve, if you're interested in that. That was also a study uh, by a rather conservative scientist, uh, backed up also by some politicians, and they claim that, you know, why are so many African Americans in the United States involved in crime? And that was literally attributed to their low intelligence, right? Um, that is problematic, and what we see typically is when we go back basically to Lombroso, right? Lombroso also had the assumption that there are born criminals, and these people are different, they have certain uh, distinct physical uh, features. And if you look at these features, uh, his theory is also uh, often referred to as the theory of atavism. Atavism implying these people are backward. They're not properly evolved. So if you look at these pictures, you know, they, you know, to a certain extent, start to resemble primates or apes, if you will. And this is obviously rather problematic if you take into account uh, race in this day and age. So there is that way of thinking which is... Uh, still there, but it's obviously no longer politically correct because it's also nonsense to assume such a monocausal relationship and to ignore all kinds of social factors such as poverty, uh, etc., etc. But there is still that way of thinking. But proper science is no longer interested in elimination. You know, the most the most problematic era I can think of, for example, is Nazi Germany, right? The whole idea of Jews as being inferior, and if you set groups apart that way, you know, the end point might even be concentration camps, who knows. Um, nowadays, obviously, it is more at the individual level, and it has a lot to do with diagnostics, right? If someone has issues, disorders, uh, has a lot of energy, is a thrill seeker, you know, you would like to diagnose this and perhaps uh, prescribe pills in combination to therapy. Um, so, uh, it was very much discredited after the Nazi regime, very unpopular in the 50s and 60s. Uh, I remember even in the Netherlands there was a professor, uh, Buikhuizen, I think that was in the 70s or perhaps the 80s, who was also starting to set up uh, research, uh, exploring uh, biology, and he was also, you know, he was regarded as some kind of Dr. Mengele, right? It was very unpopular because people were very fearful of what this might lead to. Um, but nowadays, certainly in the 90s, there are a lot of research, also research dealing with the brain, which is also very popular science. Uh, so it is here to stay, and it is actually incredible science. But it's very much at a micro level. Yes? Do you see that it's going to become bigger and bigger in the future? So because, uh, like, it's written there that it used to be quite big, then it shifted to something smaller because of the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. So at least personally, I have the impression that it's going against this idea of, you know, looking at the race or the background of someone and just assuming that this person is this or that. Right. And it's becoming more and more of a thing, yeah. especially nowadays. And I have the impression that it's going to become bigger again. Do you think that's the case? That's a very good question. I don't know, but I do. I do have the feeling that it's becoming more and more popular. You even have all of these popular books on the brain, and then people assume that well, the brain is who you are. But there is still no, there is no um, single identifiable thing in your brain that makes you do stuff. Right? No. It's way more complex. But people also have this idea that there is, for example, uh, a violent gene. No. Right? No, uh, but I didn't mean it. On a genetic level, I meant it on an aspect level. At it? Uh, aspect level. I, like, I mean, I have the impression that like 
a lot of times, especially nowadays, we look at the aspect of someone and then we decide whether this, this person is dangerous or not. Right. And and I don't know, like, yeah, okay. that's that's what I thought because you were saying you you put it on a by on a brain perspective, right? But I the way I see it is more into a physical appearance. Right. I get what you're saying, and then you're tapping into, for example, racial profiling, for example, yeah. right? Yeah. Or the fact I, that if you would walk the street and you see a person yeah. who resembles this, people are more fearful, for yeah. example, <laughs> because they've seen also all of these. Well, again, about media images, the typical predator out there is a young black male, for example. Sure, I think that's still uh, that's still there. And that's how people, even if they are politically correct during conversations, people have these stereotypes and associations, for sure. So that's also a very good point. It's perhaps the science is more internal, but still people use uh, the physical to make uh, an assessment, right? The first impression is, is oftentimes crucial. It's a good point. Um, so that is biological theory. I'm not a biologist, so I'm not gonna bother you with all kinds of uh, complex chemical processes. Um, but it's still there. It's now again more and more popular, but do realize it's more nuanced. It is that interplay nature nurture, and it is all about multiple cells. Right? I think I, I've given this example before. Even if you have a kid who has ADHD, for example, right, has a lack, uh, has trouble concentrating, right, very energetic, people assume there's a correlation between that and thrill seeking and, for example, criminal behavior, shoplifting, for example. But then again, <laughs> that that same kid could be, if you put that kid, uh, let him play soccer or something else, right, let him channel his energy in a proper way that kid could actually be great at that particular sport, right? So it's not inevitable that these things will turn out into crime or that that person will become a criminal. The, uh, the social factors are very important. Um, okay, so that's biological um, theory. And it all dates back to uh, Lombroso, um, who was measuring skulls and assumed there is a direct relationship there. All right, is that clear? Yeah. Uh, so that is a positivistic theory, right? It's positivism because it's science, uh, and it is at a micro level. You must not forget this. Um, moving on. Rational choice theory. which is uh, a bit more complex, um, linking it to paradigms and explanatory levels, but I'm going to try to uh, give you a proper understanding of rational choice theory. We have been talking about this before. Um, this is actually the only theory out there uh, that is very much uh, linked to the uh, classic paradigm. Not so much the positivistic, uh, but the classical one. Uh, so the assumption is that people are always looking for uh, benefits, right? People are, you know, a person is a so-called homo economicus. Uh, so the idea is that people weigh the pros and cons. Um, and this is a very popular theory, uh, often used in this day and age because you can do all kinds of very clear, tangible things based on this theory. Um, so if you want to prevent crime, rational choice theory assumes you have to do something about these weighing the pros and cons, right? You have to make sure that uh, the disbenefits start outweighing the benefits of committing crime. And how would we do this if we assume potential criminals are calculating if they should or should not commit crime. The way to do this is to do something about available targets and to do something about guardianship. A motivated offender is actually taken for granted. Rational choice theory assumes every one of us is to a certain extent motivated to commit crime, given the right opportunities and chances, right? 
Um, but some people, uh, you know, exploit these opportunities more than others. And so we have to do something about opportunities. That's what rational choice theory uh, is basically about. If you decrease the opportunities, crime will decline, right? Because criminals at some point will refrain from committing crime because it's too difficult to break into a house or they lack the resources, the knowledge, the skill, or they have the idea that the chances of uh, getting caught are huge, tremendous. At that point, the assumption is people will refrain from committing crime. This is also uh, known as the routine acti activity theory, which is under that more general heading of rational choice theory. So, uh, for crime to be committed, there must be three elements, an available target, a motivated offender, and a lack of guardians. So, we need to do something about available targets and guardians, right? Um, because it is a rational decision. And so the idea is um, you need to make potential targets less attractive and no longer a rational target. That's the assumption, right? Because at that point, uh, the cons are bigger than the pros. Um, so typically, this way of thinking leads to more fences, locks, uh, alarm systems, cameras. This is a type of prevention, which is not so much uh, social prevention. It's not about <laughs> taking away root causes or doing something about a genetic imbalance or something like that. We are not curing criminals, right? Uh, it is actually situational prevention. We're trying to alter the situation in such a way that uh, people uh, are less inclined to commit crime in that particular situation. That doesn't mean that crime will disappear. Why not? What will likely happen if you install... Uh, Alarm systems, cameras, higher fences, what will likely happen? Crime is pushed underground and people will find other ways to commit crime. Sure, sure, yes. Right, right. They might use different crimes. We have been talking about this two weeks ago as well, right? Living in an online digital world. So there is that effect of displacement, right? People will find different crimes to pursue the same objective, namely money, for example. Yes, it's just too difficult to break in. Uh, to rob a bank, and you might do that uh, online, for example. Cybercrime is a brilliant example. Yes? Business or the different crimes that you might face, or I should say, um, I guess you have to set up something to set up security measures. Like let's say an alarm system, then they learn first how to set off an alarm system. So that would be the first thing, and that would shift and then they would adjust. So that would take time. Right. The first thing that it will change, so you cannot rob. Right. Good example. Um, and at the same time, there's also the banal fact that, for example, if uh, one house is particularly difficult to enter, people will go to the neighbors, for example, right? Where there is not that high fence, where the alarm system is not that difficult to disarm. So you have a huge issue when it comes to displacement, right? It's not that there will no longer be criminals, uh, but the criminals will go somewhere else or will start committing different crimes. It's not 100% displacement, but... The idea obviously is you do something about the target. So that target, that particular target, will no longer be targeted, right? But there are still motivated offenders out there. They still have a motivation. So they will seek other opportunities. Um, and situational crime prevention can take many forms and, um, you know, it can address many types of crimes. It's often applied. Um, when it comes to uh, guarding your house or uh, your shop, um, but it's also applied in the public domain. Uh, let me give you one exotic example. 
I used to take the train from Rotterdam to um, um, The Hague. And when I uh, would leave The Hague, the HS uh, train station at 10 o'clock at night, for example, I would always hear classical music. Is that still the case? Anyone traveling by train these days? No? Okay, I would hear classical music and I would think, okay, this is nice. Is this for us customers to uh, relax, enjoy, not be frustrated because our train is late or something like that? Do you have any idea why this might be actually situational crime prevention? What could this address? Well, it's a frustrating situation, so you implement calming and soothing music because that's what's supposed to calm down whoever's in the conduct. Right, right. Uh, so it, it has that uh, objective as well. It's also a bit reminiscent of, for example, if you go to a bakery, they might also uh, use odors to entice you to buy certain goods, for example, right? So it addresses leg legitimate customers and users. But it also, this is very important, it also uh, addresses illegitimate users. Uh, in the case of classical music, for example, it addresses nuisance and disturbance. Disturbance and nuisance often caused by youngsters loitering, which is a big thing in the Netherlands. We think of this as problematic as such. If young people between the age of 10 and 18 uh, simply hang out in public space, that might be regarded loitering. You don't want that because it might actually scare people who have the idea that that group might be threatening, right? Playing the classical music is a very cunning trick to prevent this because the assumption is young people are not into classical music. It's not cool to hang out and listen to Mozart or Beethoven, for example. So they no longer, they're no longer there, right? So that is one of the, just an exotic example where situational crime prevention might address nuisance. Um, and it has the same logic um, if you apply it to uh, an alarm system uh, and a bank. You want illegitimate users to um, not enter a store. And the same is true for uh, the Hague HS train station. You don't want people loitering. So you can have endless variations. But the thing is, there is obviously displacement. It's very naive to assume that these youngsters listening to Beethoven will all of a sudden think, well, let's go home and study, right? Very likely they will end up loitering somewhere else, right? So it, is a, it has also this not in my backyard uh, type of uh, reason behind it. Oftentimes there is uh, a lot of displacement. Yes? Just uh, since what you talked about now with using uh, food products, Absolutely, that's a brilliant point. There's actually a lot of scholars who are into organized crime or white collar crime who argue that living in a global village, internationalization, uh, is is you know is very attractive not only for legitimate business but also for illegitimate business because what you can do. Uh, you look for uh, available targets, so you go to third world countries where you can, for example, dispose garbage, right? Um, and typically in these third world countries, there is a lack of guardians. There is no rule of law, there is no central authority. So that's a brilliant example. Rational choice theory makes a lot of sense if we would study a lot of white collar crime, and corporate crime, organized crime. Because that's also very much a rational operation, right? The idea is to make profit. So you want to exploit um, loopholes. You want to exploit uh, certain parts of the world, et cetera, et cetera. That's a good point. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but this is a very popular um, uh, and attractive theory for politicians, policy makers, uh, because you can immediately do something about crime, right? It's very tangible. Um, you know, if there is a high volume of crime in a, in a particular uh, place, uh, you put a high fence and the crime will decrease in that particular space, right? It's a bit reminiscent of Donald Trump and putting the wall 
keeping the Mexicans out, right? It's also situational crime prevention or situational prevention. Um, but so it's very uh, visible, it's very tangible. Something is being done immediately. Um, and there is typically also a decrease of crime in that particular area. Uh, that makes it very attractive. Uh, whereas if you would invest in education, right? If you would invest in better cities, that's way more elusive. And the payoff is also less direct. Right? <coughs> it might take years before you can actually reap the benefits. Whereas if you put high fences and camera, uh, cameras somewhere you know, immediately, you do something about that local crime issue. If you take this to an extreme level, so we talked about biological theory and taking it to an extreme level, you end up with uh, the final solution, Nazi Germany and, and Jews, which is a very uh, extreme level. If you take this to an extreme level, uh, you also end up with a, you know, I would argue, not very inclusive society. What would happen if we would only focus base our public policies on situational crime prevention. What would life look like? Can someone give me an example of this? Yes. Right. It's certainly a lack of trust because everywhere apparently there are motivated offenders, right? And we need to guard ourselves. Yes. Yes. Good point. Yeah, because there would be kind of SOPs for everything. We had an example of the Texas uh, prison prison system. Yeah. Um, in a previous course, for example, where the prisoners have their the, the ways they will walk, and everything. So we would have restrictions and everything on their community plan. Right. Uh, they got them with the prison walk. So there would be control everywhere. Planning. Yes. Other thoughts? Yes. Yes. Perhaps it might be difficult to distinguish what is the inside, what is the outside. When, are, when am I in prison? When I'm, am I out of prison? Right? If, if we resemble one prison regime, for example. Um, yes. Final. Uh, that this could be more crime, in my opinion, because it would make people feel more safe. Because if they see a camera or they hear classical music, so they feel safer, and they don't assume right. that some crime could happen. While the crime actually could. Sure, there might also be the, the illusion. The they don't care about the police. Right, there might also be the illusion of, okay, uh, someone is watching over my shoulders, whereas, okay, there's everywhere, CCTV is everywhere, but is everyone also manning these cameras? I think not, right? No. Um, it's the security in an airplane, so that people think that with the security measures they're going to survive. And right. You crash, and most of the time you don't, so. Yes, oh, that's. Indeed, hilarious, these little videos, what to do in case of a crash, yes. Yeah. Well, you need to be Superman to get out of there alive, obviously. Yes? Uh, um, I agree with what most people have already said, but then when it comes to the actual criminal, each and every offender who is ever caught and sentenced, there is no, uh, no, there are no, there are no circumstances to justify their behavior. Everything was a cost-benefit analysis, and you deserve exactly what you're getting. Right, right. So there are no mit mitigating circumstances. Absolutely, it's a good point. Um, another, the point I also want to make, and, I'm, and then I'm wrapping up rational choice theory. I mean, it's very attractive for politicians because immediately benefits. It's also very much a do-it-yourself U.S. type of thing, right? With the whole weapon and guns discussion, you just defend your property. But it's a very individual solution to a social problem, right? If we argue crime to a certain extent is also a social problem, having to do with, for example, poverty, having to do with living in rundown neighborhoods, that sort of stuff. If you only individualize this problem, you don't tackle certain uh, root causes, right? And you might end up with, for example, people, uh, I'm thinking here of Latin America, where you have, for example, huge gated communities, right? A gated community for me is also a paradigmatic example of situational crime prevention, right? Perhaps you are, you're being protected in your own little bubble, right? But the minute you leave that gated community in your SUV, you are in some kind of guerrilla warfare jungle type of arrangement. I mean, there's so many social tensions in these uh, cities, uh, in these countries. And, you know, basically the haves and the have-nots, uh, you know, will, there will be a greater social distance between them, right? 
people will withdraw from public space. Uh, and if you have the money, if you can afford it, you will you know, live in that gated community with the walls and the fences. But it's not a very sustainable and ethical solution to you know, fundamental social problems. Am I making sense? So, uh, and to a certain extent, the gated community is also a bit reminiscent of a prison. So perhaps it's a prison for the elite, but you're also confined to a particular space, right? Um, so in the spirit of safety and security management studies, I would argue these are typically very tangible and useful tools uh, and it makes a lot of sense in certain organizations, but you don't want to base public policy exclusively on this, right? It raises all kinds of ethical issues. Uh, I mean, just to show you how surreal things can get, I put a uh, YouTube link in that slide and it's a link uh, showing a video of people in some kind of factory in China where they actually uh, uh, assemble uh, iPhones. So the creative thinking is all in <coughs> California, obviously, right? The Steve Jobs uh, folks. But then uh, putting these uh, things together, typically in China. <coughs> Corporate crime exploiting opportunities. You go to third world countries. Why? Cheap labor, right? Uh, but a couple of years ago, people working these factories were complaining and were rioting, actually, because of bad working conditions and because the pay was horrible, right? Uh, and people, uh, apparently, a lot, lot of them get, got so depressed that they were actually jumping off buildings and they would die on the premises <coughs> of these uh, factories, right? A problem, I would argue, right? Okay, now, what would be a cynical uh, situational prevention to deal with this issue? That you have to know the story better. Other people can have the story to talk to you better. Right, right. So, this is just to illustrate, uh, <coughs> taking to an extreme, what, what happens, not altering working conditions, but putting safety nets to break the fall. It's right. cheaper. Uh, the, you know, the net result is there. Yes, someone didn't die. It's an illusion that the people who fell on these safety nets would all of a sudden think, well, my depression is gone. Let's get back to work, right? <laughs> so the idea of uh, the motivated offender is still there. But that is situational prevention. You just prevent people from dying on that particular spot. That's the only thing you do. Or you just create a Best break time activity ever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be a very nice indirect result, indeed. Uh, just relaxing, jump off these buildings. Um, also reminds me a bit of Silicon Valley, where you have these creative <coughs> folks playing ping pong and also not working in cubicles and stuff like that. Yeah, you would have these people in brave. third world countries, indeed, uh, jumping off buildings. Brave and we would have a, a brave new world. Absolutely. So it can be it can be very cynical. That's the point I want to make here. But it's nonetheless it's a very effective solution to local uh, crime problems, right? Is that clear? Yeah. You with me? All right. Let me let me <coughs> deal with one more theory. Give me eight minutes, and I will have that break. Uh, control theory. Very influential theory. Um, Biological theory and rational choice theory are very much at the micro level. Um, it assumes individuals who are driven by <coughs> either uh, nature, in the case of biological theory, or driven by hedonism, um, looking for benefits, in the case of rational choice theory. Uh, now, the control theory is at the meso level. So this is a theory very influential, it addresses the social surroundings, where people are born and raised, uh, institutions such as family and school, all of these things are very important uh, in explaining crime, understanding crime. And the basic assumption of control theorists is actually uh, that the question should not be why do people commit crime, the question should be why do most people do not commit crime? What could explain this? Why are there so many law-abiding citizens? What do they have to lose? That's actually uh, something control theory tries to answer. 
So it assumes that uh, you know we are individuals, we have desires and wishes, but most of the time we do not act on these desires and wishes. Things would turn out very ugly, I would argue, right? If you could do whatever you want, then this would be an ugly place, right? So most of the time we actually behave, right? You have a role to play, you're our students, uh, but I'm not a master who is in total control. I also have a role to play, right? If I would start yelling and hitting you, uh, getting undressed, that would be very inappropriate, and that would be negative consequences, right? In all likelihood, I would lose my job, right? Um, so I also have something to lose. So it all, it all goes back to Durkheim, that famous sociologist, who argues uh, there's all kinds of constraints limiting human behavior. And that's a good thing, because otherwise we could not coexist, could not live together, right? So we constantly need to adjust. Um, so control theory takes that and argues, uh, typically, people who commit crime uh, are not uh, are not so much involved socially. They're typically outcasts, loners. And control theory argues, you know, there are certain elements that keep an individual from committing crime, uh, namely, if you have a family, uh, if you go to church, if you go to school, if you have a job, these are things that make sure that you stay on the right path, right? Yes. Quick question. So does control theory posit that uh, crime can be curbed by preventing enemy? No, that's another um, famous uh, work by Durkheim, Anomi, indeed, which is the assumption that uh, there is some kind of uh, a moral universe, people lack the social coordinates to uh, behave at all. Durkheim, for example, also wrote a very uh, interesting book on <coughs> suicide, uh, if you remember that, if you remember that book. And the assumption was that uh, in times of great social change, that some people um, simply do no longer know how to behave because there, there's no longer that distinct uh, set of cultural objectives. And because of this, people uh, might feel alienated. Um, let me give you a, a very uh, interesting example, an example I think is very interesting. Did any of you ever see uh, the movie The Shawshank Redemption? The movie, the prison movie? There, there is that, that's a great movie. Uh, but there is that brilliant scene where a guy who was in prison for decades, at some point he's being released, and what does he do? He hangs himself. That guy suffers from anomie because he was in that very controlled environment for such a long time, and all of a sudden he's being let loose, and he simply, he cannot deal with that freedom. That is anomie. If you, can't, if you, you know, uh, if you at some point run into a totally different environment and you lack the social coordinates to behave, basically. But, but, Dur but Durkheim would indeed argue that uh, what is very important, and this is also what control theory is, get from Durkheim, what's very important is to have a family that's an objective of raising your kids, a reproduction, uh, church is indeed a value system, uh, and school and work would also be objectives for law-abiding citizens. That is the way to go. That is how to climb the social ladder. So if that's what you're hinting at, I'm following you actually. So without these elements... Well, if you don't value them or you don't feel connected to your church, your family, or your right. family, isn't that an example? Right. Uh, I get what you're saying, but then the assumption is, so criminals, uh, not only do they commit crime, but they might also lack, they also lack values. They simply don't have values. That's what you're saying. No. Or they no. lack the mainstream values. No, that they're disconnected from them in, one, in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. I get what you're saying. I think I will touch, I will touch on this when I discuss string theory. Because strain theory actually addresses uh, um, structural exclusion. I'll talk more about this. So lacking certain uh, routes uh, towards achievement, but cultural inclusion. I'll talk about this. Um, so the assumption of control theory is um, having a family, going to work are things that limit us, control us. Um, the fact that I have three kids, I have a job, implies a 
it's a very unwise thing to, uh, I don't know, to go out binge drinking every night. Um, at some point, um, my wife uh, will find this very problematic. She will uh, divorce me. She will, uh, I don't know, there's a, there's a likelihood I will not see my kids. I will get fired. There's all of these negative consequences. So control theory argues it's a good thing that you are actually being controlled. You're being watched, not only by your boss, not only by your government, but also by your wife, by your kids. Control is a vice versa thing. It's a two-way street, basically. Um, and it makes, I think it makes sense to a certain extent, although it's a very conservative theory. Um, but it makes sense in that, um, you know, if you look at the risk factors when it comes to recidivism, so people who ended up in prison and who are being released, a huge percentage of them actually go back to prison after a few years, right? Typically, that's because they still lack these elements, right? Um, while in prison, uh, they, you know, come back and there's no longer uh, a missus. Uh, there might be problems with kids. So you're still a loner. Um, you might lack the proper diploma certifications. So finding a job might be very difficult. And even if you find a job, that might be your criminal record, right? We talked about this before. It's not more about this when we'll discuss labeling theory. Uh, so if all of these routes are basically blocked, right? It makes sense that so many of them will start committing crime. So uh, oftentimes, uh, very important um, success stories of people who actually <laughs> turn their lives around typically um, uh, have something in common, namely that person <laughs> found the love of his life, right? So many adolescents who have, for example, a criminal career, at some point they might get a girlfriend and they might get married, start a family. So it would be a very wise idea, for example, not only to offer people jobs when they actually leave prison, but also to start a dating agency to hook up these people with, uh, with partners, basically. Um, so there is that element. And success stories typically also uh, have something to do with the fact that people were able to find a job, find a house, and start <laughs> uh, building a normal conventional life. But if these things are you know, problematic, uh, then you will <laughs> remain that loner, basically. That's what control theory argues. So, uh, you know, it's conservative in the sense that it has this idea of you have to start to raise a family, you need to go to church, uh, go to school, and get a job. That is, uh, in essence, uh, control theory. Uh, and it makes sense. I mean, control is everywhere. This is very much informal control. Right? So everyone is uh, controlling uh, each other, one another. So it's a very informal procedure. Um, so it's unlike CCTV, which is formal control. Informal control is actually way more effective because people typically relate to significant others. You're more inclined to listen to your friend or your mom than, for example, a police officer. So there must be these bonds. And this is where Yushi comes in. He has a very famous theory called the social bonding theory which is actually under that general heading of control theory. And he argues criminals typically lack these four bonds. They lack attachment, commitment, involvement, belief. And typically attachment is something which starts at a very uh, young age. Typically attachment starts the minute you're born, you start attaching to your mother, obviously, in most cases. Um, and then within the family, you will have more and more attachments if you're lucky. Um, you will start to be committed in the sense that uh, you want to do good, you want to follow the conventional path, uh, you might go to school, um, you might get a job. Involvement also means that you are a not only a law-abiding citizen but also an, an active citizen. So typically if you're involved in neighborhood affairs, um, organizing barbecues, that sort of stuff, then you are very much part of that particular community. And there is a belief system. You believe in the shared uh, values and norms of a particular community. And the assumption is criminals uh, typically lack one of these bonds and they're loners, hence they have less to lose. 
right? Hence, they are more likely to commit crime. And it, this also makes sense. Think about it. I mean, if you are living on the streets and your only objective is to get drugs every day, right? Um, getting caught by a police officer and being sent to prison, is that, does that concern you? Is that a negative thing, you think? Really? Depends. For that person? Exactly. That's. I mean, if you think about it, if you have nothing to lose, then that's actually a positive thing. You have a roof over your head. There's a meal. It's warm. So these are typically people who have less to lose. They are already stigmatized, loners, outcasts. Whereas if you are a family man, if you have a job, then there are real consequences, and that will affect your life tremendously in a negative way, right? Um, but that's not the case with, uh, for example, loners, vagrants, beggars. Um, but this is also a very influential theory, and typically it argues we should intensify social control. We should do something about um, social control. Typically, policymakers try to intervene at the level of family when there's problems with uh, child rearing, raising kids, when there's problems in school. For example, if uh, kids uh, are not in school, right, in the middle of the day, if, if they hang out on the streets, um, there's a problem with that uh, because people assume, well, if you don't go to school, if you don't get the proper diplomas, if you don't have the proper social control, there's no teacher controlling you, you don't have uh, fellow students who control you, you might end up not only poor and lonely, but perhaps also as a criminal. So. Uh, typically, school and family are actually the institutions where interventions take place to prevent worse, basically, right? So it's a very popular theory uh, for those who are into youth crime and social control. Does that make sense? Yes? Final question. Final question, and we'll have a break. Can, can we relate this actually to this term of aging out? Because when we think about, okay, someone growing up, someone gets older and older, so you might get settled, you might get a right. job, you might not get a job, you might get lazy, um, and then decide, okay, I'm stopping, I'm stopping, now. okay, maybe <laughs> you've got five children, I don't know, or maybe, okay, that might give you the incentive to not to, to, to commit a crime, but is it uh, relatable to, to this term of aging out? Absolutely. My answer is very brief. Yes, that's spot on. Uh, aging out not only has a biological component that, you know, people who study the brain assume that at a very young age you don't oversee all the consequences, but at an older age, certainly if you start studying, get a job, there's also more responsibilities. And that's where control theory comes in. So that's absolutely right. Typically, adolescents are still uh, not married, uh, might not have a full-time job, uh, and these are typically things, control theories, argue are very important for us, uh, for all of us, making sure that we behave as law-abiding citizens, yes. So that has everything to do with our responsibilities and having something to lose, I would argue. All right, let's have that break. Let's have a short break. Can we have a seven-minute break? Will that work? Yeah.